Hey everybody, it's time for chapter two in sociology. Woohoo! And as is my custom, I'm going to start off with a quote from Peter Berger. He said, it is the essence of the human mind to take apart what experience presents as a whole. Oscar Wilde said, the truth is never pure and rarely simple. And Alfred Kaczynski said, there are two ways to slide easily through life, to believe everything and to doubt everything. Both ways save us from thinking. And that's the last thing we want to have to do. Think for ourselves, please just tell me what to think. Okay, so this chapter focuses on sociological investigation. Uh, in terms of ways of knowing, Rolf Dahrendorf said, there are other avenues to knowledge besides the objective experience of our senses. I mean, think about the objective experience of our senses. Your senses can be fooled. For example, look at magicians. They regularly take advantage of our senses in order to fool us. So, uh, or for example, if you think about our senses, we can't detect subtle changes in the environment. So is the air getting better or worse? We can't detect that. That's why we need scientific in instruments to help us figure that out. I would also suggest that wisdom is more important than knowledge. Wisdom is knowledge applied. Wisdom converts knowing to experiencing. So it's one thing to know something, it's far more important to experience it. In fact, that's what we are here in life to do, to experience reality, uh, at least what appears to be reality. More on that later. Uh, so it's not enough knowing. So when you're growing up and somebody says, oh my gosh, where do you go to school? It's going to be awesome. Okay, so that sounds great. You know it will be, but until you actually experience it, you don't know. Or uh, where do you fall in love? And oh yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. And well, you don't know until you actually experience it because words can't really describe it. You just have to physically and emotionally experience it. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, "A mind stretched by a new experience can never go back to its old dimensions." Now, I can't remember if I warned you about this or not when we were talking about Chapter One, and I went over the course, but. A lot of what we're going to talk about in this course is to try to stretch your consciousness a little bit, to expand your consciousness. And it's too late now because you're already enrolled in the course. But once your consciousness is expanded, it's permanently expanded. You can't go back. So no extra charge for that one. Okay. Um, in terms of ways of knowing, Americans use many non-scientific ways of knowing despite our emphasis on scientific proof. For example, when asked the question, what is your astrological sign, 99% of respondents knew their sign. Now, there is absolutely no legitimacy to astrology whatsoever. Uh, and a, a famous study, well, when that famous, I knew about it, so I guess it's famous, but a study of astrologists, self-proclaimed astrologists, uh, they gave them a survey and they they tested their abilities and they found that not one could predict what's actually going to happen tomorrow nevertheless it's always fun to read our horror scope to see what it claims is going to happen because every now and then like three days out of 365 it's spot on you go it's amazing they knew exactly what i was going to experience today yeah that comes under the heading of every squirrel finds at least one nut uh, another survey found that 18% of people had direct experience with aliens. I'm not talking about aliens from another country. I'm talking about aliens from another planet. Now, one of the things that always fascinates me about this, because I spent a lot of time reading informative news magazines like The Inquirer and The Insider. It's for inquiring minds. And in those, they talk about the episodic adventures of people who have been abducted by aliens. Now, if you know anything about this, what invariably happens to people who have been kidnapped by aliens? That's right, they get probed in the <clears throat> posterior. And it doesn't really make sense, you know? And I'm thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm thinking, how is this that these 
beings are capable of intergalactic space travel. Yet when it comes to investigating our bodies, their scientific instruments are so puny that they have to probe us in the butt in order to figure out anything about how our bodies operate. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, this mystified me for years. Now, here's a trick I've learned, but you have to trust the process. If there's something you don't know, just tuck it away in the back of your mind and trust the fact that when you need to know the answer, it will come to you. Now, this only works if you trust the process, but I guarantee it works. So I thought, what is the answer to this? I can't understand this. So years went by. And then one night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and it was like, I had the answer. I had the answer. And it occurred to me, the answer was, how is it that these intergalactic beings that are capable of intergalactic space travel, why is it that they have to probe us in the ass in order to learn anything about our bodies. And it occurred to me it makes perfect sense if they were from the, are you ready? The planet Uranus. All right. You know, this reminds me of another uh, interesting story, I hope. Um, this happened, I don't know, several years ago. And I remember uh, joking about it with Dr. Richardson. Uh, who saw the uh, same article I did in the New York Times. And apparently in, um, I guess it was South Carolina, but it was one of those TV evangelism shows, just a local show. I don't know if you've ever seen TV evangelists in action, but they're always shilling for money. And in fact, uh, a study found that uh, all their money comes from about 5% of the citizenry and it's little old ladies, you know, good Christian ladies, who are dipping out of their savings and giving it to these TV evangelists, who more often than not have been found guilty of absconding the funds and spending it on lavish lifestyles and so forth. Of course, all in the name of the Lord. But anyway, so if you ever watch them, they're very animated. You know, it's like, do you believe in the sweet saving grace of the Lord Jesus? Right? So this guy's in the middle of his routine and about halfway through the show, uh, one of the technicians at the station messes up and switches off the show and instead in its place appears an X-rated movie. So when the show was over, they did a survey of the people who watched the show and they found that 72% of the people watching the show thought their prayers were finally answered. Well, let's move on, shall we? In your text is a list of six statements North Americans consider common sense when, in fact, scientific evidence partly contradicts each one. So, yeah, all the well, that's just common sense. Uh, not necessarily. That's just what everybody believes. See, what often is common sense is somebody says so, and then everybody, yo, I heard that. Um, if you think about it, that's been a, a, a famous way for Trump to get uh, ideas across. So, I heard somebody said, you know, and somebody might have said it, but nobody who has any, nobody who knows anything about the situation said he just passes along hearsay and then passes it along as though it's fact and it's worked fabulously well for him. Anyway, so, you know, the fact that we consider it common sense doesn't mean that in fact it's accurate. Uh, by the way, those are on page 32. You don't need to know them for the exam. I'm just pointing it out to you. But this is nothing new because Rene Descartes said, from my earliest years, I have accepted many false opinions as true. So facts standing alone do not constitute compelling truth. Okay, so science is a way of knowing a form of truth a logical system that bases knowledge on direct systematic observation. Well, let's move on, shall we? I know you're pretty busy. Let's get right to something you need to know uh, for the exam. But first, a quote from Peter Berger, the sociologist who I quote often in this course. He said, in science as in love, a concentration on technique is likely to lead to impotence. Words of wisdom for life, folks. Okay, so you need to know, starting on page 34, cause and effect relationship among variables. It's just logical thinking. 
It's Western logic, scientific thinking, scientific reasoning. Cause and effect is a relationship in which change in one variable causes change in another. This linkage is important because it enables us to predict how one pattern of behavior will affect another, to predict the outcome of future events. If we know one thing, we can accurately predict the other. Within this, you have the independent variable. The independent variable is the causal variable, the variable that causes the change. Think about the term independent. Just memorize the terms. You can figure this out. Independent, causal. So for example, if we have a bowl of water, right? Uh, the independent variable, the, the, the independent variable will be with the temperature change that causes the water to change. So if the temperature drops, then the water turns to ice. If the temperature increases, then it evaporates faster. So the dependent variable would be the variable that is changed in this case, this, the dish of water, right? The dependent variable. Let's think that through. Would that mean it's dependent on something to change it? Yeah, the independent variable, the causal variable, get it? Now think about this one too, it only makes sense. The independent variable has to precede the dependent variable in time, right? Okay, so the dependent variable in this example is the dish of water. Well, first, the temperature has to change in order for the water to be affected one way or the other, right? So the independent variable always precedes the dependent variable in time. Now, I point this out because sometimes I got feedback, so water is always a dependent variable. No, 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 no. Just in this example, in another example, water could be the independent variable. So. You know, an independent variable in one situation or experiment could be the dependent variable in another. I just gave you this as an example, a real simple one. Dependent variable, water, independent variable, temperature change. Temperature changes, then it affects the dependent variable, the water. Systems theory uh, holds that no one dimension of social life can be ex completely explained by any single cause or independent variable. Um, some people argue that there are closed systems in the universe. So imagine a perfectly closed circle and nothing can get uh, outside from inside the circle, can't go outside and nothing outside can penetrate the circle. Uh, others argue that there are no closed systems in the entire universe. Everything is an open system. Now think about the implications of that. Every system. So when we talk about systems, we're talking about uh, uh, your body system, uh, the system of stars, the galaxies, uh, the system of the environment. These are all systems with all these component parts. So the argument is all these systems are open systems. If that's true, then that means everything in the universe is constantly affecting everything else because as open systems, that means everything from the outside can penetrate to the inside of the system and the system can exert influence on everything outside the system. Therefore, everything in the universe affects everything else, which is not unlike what many of the mystics have argued, and the sages and the great gurus over the years, is that everything in the universe is interconnected and interpenetrated and interdependent. Correlation is in evidence when two or even more variables are shown to vary together. Okay, so here you have two variables. The one goes up, the other goes up. The one goes down, the other goes down. Or one goes up and the other goes down correspondingly. Exactly. So somehow they seem to vary together. Spurious correlation is the variables, even though they vary together, have no causal link to one another. A false relationship where the cause lies in another variable. Now herein is where we get a lot of our logic messed up. And so we'll say, because there are two variables, like for example, um, I'll give you an example back in uh, the 90s when Clinton was president, there was concern about crime. Uh, crime, by the way, has dropped dramatically in the United States since the 1990s, even though you wouldn't know it by watching the news. 
Uh, anyway, so uh, what can we do about crime? So they passed billions of dollars in money to uh, hire more police all around the United States. Local police departments could now have more money accessible to them to do that. And the next year, crime went down. Okay, so if you just take it at that very simplistic level and you go, see, money goes up for police, crime goes down. Therefore, one had to cause the other, but not necessarily true. Because what also happens is every time the economy goes up, crime goes down for reasons that should be obvious. No need to steal, for example, because you got a job. Okay, so at that time, the economy also went up. So what caused crime to go down? The police, the spending on the police, or the economy going up, or was it a combination of the two? But it certainly wasn't exclusively money was spent in police, crime went down. It's more complex than that, particularly in a social world. I'll give you another study. Uh, this study found that Swedish couples, not Swedish fish, Swedish couples who cohabit prior to marriage. Now, if you're not familiar with the term cohabitating, that's like shacking up, living in sin, living together before marriage. Let me go back again. A recent study found that Swedish couples who cohabit prior to marriage are more likely to divorce than those who do not. Okay, one variable can, is uh, correlated to the other. So does this mean that cohabitating, living together before marriage, causes divorce? Well, one of the researchers claims not. He thinks, that he said this is a spurious correlation between the two variables. He believes that people who cohabit are less committed to the idea of marriage to begin with and are thus more likely to end the marriage later on. In other words, weak commitment to marriage probably causes both cohabitating and divorce. Cohabitating and divorce are correlated, but with a spurious correlation. Okay, uh, then sometimes what, what uh, scientific investigation will do is introduce what's called a control, a technique holding constant all variables except one in order to see clearly the effect of that variable. Uh, so for example, in um, uh, vaccine studies or any kind of a study uh, involving uh, a new drug that will have a control group who isn't told whether or not they're receiving the, um, the actual vaccine that's being tested or just, um, I don't know, whatever you'll get, sugar, water, whatever is an innocuous inoculation. Uh, and so they don't know. And so the other group, so no group, there, neither of the two groups knows which one in that group, the people in those groups, neither knows which one's actually getting the vaccine. Uh, however, the researchers do. So is the vaccine effective? Yes, you can compare it to what happens to the control group who did not receive the vaccine. Okay, so on page 35, check out figure 2-1 for an example of how correlation is not the same as cause. So to summarize, on page 35, to establish cause and effect, three requirements must be met. One, a demonstrated correlation, meaning that two or more variables are changing together, the temperature and the condition of the water. Two, an independent causal variable occurs before the dependent variable. The independent variable in our example, the, the water, excuse me, the temperature of the air changed, the independent variable temperature of the air changed, thereby before the dependent variable preceded it in time and therefore it changed the condition of the water. And three, no evidence that a third variable could be causing a spurious correlation between the two variables. Um, in your text, there's uh, a discussion about objectivity and research, a state of personal neutrality in conducting research. Um, when we get to my brief overview of quantum physics later in the course, no extra charge folks. Um, you will see that it is at the subatomic level, it's impossible to be objective in research and why? Because the observer 
always affects that which is being observed. Uh, it's literally called, cleverly enough, called the observer effect, but more than that when we get to it. So from that standpoint, since the observer always affects that which is being observed, there can't be any strict neutrality or objectivity in research. But another way of looking at this, uh, the sociologist Max Weber argued for more value-free objectivity in the classroom. He argued that the primary task of a useful teacher is to teach his students inconvenient facts. I mean, facts that are inconvenient for their party opinions. Well, folks, I do that all the time. I come up with um, challenging statements just to rattle your cage, your mental cage going, yeah, I know, uh, this is what you may be believing you know, as you grew up, or this is what you hear your, your parents saying, which is fine, but is it in fact true? And is it in fact true for you is most important. Um, so the, the argument would be, um, I should never reveal my personal opinions. I should never reveal my values or my biases. And so I would, uh, on a political position, offer you the conservative point of view and the liberal point of view, which I try to do as much as possible. But you know, the problem I have with that approach is if I have to do that because of you, what does that say about you as students? Think about that for a moment. You know, and anytime I say, think about that for a moment, you can hit pause and actually think about that for a moment because I'm not gonna wait, I'm just gonna keep moving on. Okay, so here's what I think it says. It says that your brains must be somewhere between wood putty and oatmeal and you can't possibly think for yourselves. And so just because Maynard, the living legend says so, you're gonna go, oh, it must be true. See, I give you more credit than that. You know, yeah, I'll tell you my opinions, but they're just my opinions. You know? And they're, they're to, you know, sometimes my opinions are not widely shared. So that's exactly why I'm trying to introduce them to you uh, so that it gives you another way of looking at things. You don't have to agree. All I ever ask you to do is understand the logic of my position. Now, many of my positions will be kind of to the liberal uh, and far more to the radical side, all the healthy thing, uh, sprinkling of spirituality infused. And so it's just my opinion. It prevails upon you to go listen to other people's opinions. It's sort of like if you watch CNN and, uh, and CNBC all the time, you really need to watch Fox or now coming on stream is Newsmax, which uh, uh, Trump administration, excuse me, Trump now says screw Max or screw Fox because they haven't stood by me 100%. So instead, he's directing everybody to Newsmax, the new uber conservative station. But my point is, if you only watch liberal stuff, you won't even know there's another point of view. If you only watch conservative stuff on Fox, you won't know there's another point of view as well. And I've watched news events come down the years, in the last four years rather, and it's almost hilarious to see the differences between the two. No wonder liberals think what they think because they're only getting a liberal take on the news all the time. And no wonder conservatives believe what they think because they're only getting a conservative take on the, on the news that wholly lets out a piece of the truth. So once again, let me throw this out. And this is all in the world according to Maynard. Everybody's right, they're just not all equally right. So the problem with the liberals is they think they got the whole truth, but they don't. The problem with the conservatives is they think they got the whole truth, but they don't. Each has a piece of the truth. And in order to get the whole truth, you need to hear the other side as well. Just to give you a quick example, think about values. Um, there are values that are traditionally conservative and there are values that are traditionally liberal. Nevertheless, taken together, they're all, they're all American values, right? So conservatives value uh, liberty, freedom. Not that liberals don't, but they put a heavy emphasis on it. Liberals value equality, equal opportunity, not to the exclusion of freedom, but they put a heavier emphasis on it. But America is about equal opportunity, equality, and it's also about freedom and liberty. It's both. So unless you understand both perspectives, you're not getting the whole truth. As Harvey Mansfield Jr. once said, as all truth is someone's truth, let's have mine. 
Okay, also for the exam, you need to know on page 37, uh, some limitations of scientific sociology. There are limitations? Yes, there are. Could you tell us what they are, Maynard? Yes, I could. No, thanks for asking. Number one, because human behavior is so complex, sociologists cannot predict individual behavior with precision. At best, only probabilities about categories of people. So remember, oh, I guess it was about 30, 40 years ago, uh, a study was done by a joint planning commission of Lehigh and Northampton counties, which comprised the Lehigh Valley. And in this study, they predicted that hordes of people, literally hordes, hordes of people were gonna be moving here from New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York. Why? Because the cost of living here is much cheaper than there. And for those who want to still work in New Jersey, New York, uh, they can commute. And so they were absolutely correct in that prediction. That has accelerated dramatically the growth of the Lehigh Valley, people moving here from New Jersey and New York and even Connecticut. Um, now, they can't predict that. You see, we knew 30 years ago that the Anderson family from East Orange, New Jersey was going to move. No, 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 no. They can't predict independent individual behavior, but sociologists can predict group behavior. They can predict um, probabilities about what's going to happen, not individual behavior. Uh, two, because humans respond to their surroundings, the mere presence of a researcher may affect the behavior being studied. Well, I'll give you a uh, little example. Um, uh, the former president of Cedarcrest, President Ambar, when she first started, uh, announced to the faculty that she was going to drop in on our classes. Now, it wasn't to spy on us or whatever, just want to get to know us better. And what better way to get to know us than to watch our rap in the class? In, in, in the case of President Amber, it was so she could watch me bomb in class with my jokes, you know, just like the students do. So anyway, she's a busy person. And oftentimes, she didn't uh, arrive at the beginning of the class, which is fine. She would just slide in during class. And so that's what she did in this particular class when I was teaching it face to face. Now she sits down, the students all know it's President Ambar. Um, and so I know it's President Ambar, she's in the room. Am I gonna start changing the way I teach? Are the students gonna start changing the way they react in class? Um, Cause it's entirely possible. Oh my gosh, the president's here, change your behavior. Uh, I didn't, and the jokes just continued to bomb. So I, I thought her um, take on my presentation was pretty interesting too, because she characterized it as, it was interesting. Oh, well, hey, she's gone. I'm still here. <laughs> anyway. Uh, also, a little anecdote there, um, she bopped in on uh, one of my colleague's classes and didn't know that my colleague wasn't teaching that class anymore. She was listed as teaching the class, but the last minute we had to get uh, an adjunct to teach the course instead. And so she bops into the class. This is the second week of class. The adjunct has no idea who she is. She has no idea who the adjunct is, and she gets there about, I don't know, 45 minutes after class starts. and. Uh, it's a two and a half hour class and the, and the adjunct starts berating her for being so late. Hey, she didn't know it was the college president. Ha ha ha. What a fun situation for the adjunct, but you know, it all worked out. Okay, uh, three, social patterns change constantly. What is true in one time or place may not hold true in another. This argues for replication, repeating the study but only a small percentage of social science research is far less than the natural sciences. Okay, well, why is that? Um, well, because things change. Uh, so for example, I don't know, let's suppose I had a theory. I know this was once true. Uh, I don't know if it still is, but let's suppose my hypothesis was that teenagers tend to hang out at the mall uh, on weekends more than they do during the week. Why? It's a gathering place. By saying, uh, if I went early in the morning uh, when the mall opens, perhaps I'd find uh, more uh, older folks walking around in the mall, you know, in terms of getting exercise and so forth. So anyway, these are just some of the habitual patterns people have observed in malls. Okay, so this is my study. So I'm going to go to the Lehigh Valley Mall 
and I'm going to go uh, every weekend for uh, uh, four weekends. And I'm also going to spend a considerable amount of time, uh, particularly after school during weekdays, to see if this is true. Are there more teenagers there in the weekdays or are there more teenagers there on weekends as a hangout place? Um, okay, so let's suppose I, after my one month study, I conclude that it's true. But what can I really conclude? All I can conclude is that it was true of the Lee Halley Valley Mall over that one month period. For this to have any kind of universal application, I would have to go to malls all over the United States, or at least a representative number of it, and repeat the same study. Now, how long would that take me? It could take me a couple of years, right? And so in the meantime, that whole thing could have changed and teenagers are no longer hanging out at the mall on weekends. So the point being um, that because social patterns change constantly, what is true in one time or place may not hold true in another, which is why it's so difficult to replicate studies. So even if I did a three-year study and found that this was true, that teenagers hang out in the mall and somebody reads my study and goes, well, I want to check this out and, re and replicate and see if this is still, tr if this holds true, if it is valid. Well, how are they going to check it out? Because things may have already changed by then and it is no longer true, which doesn't mean my study was invalid or incorrect. It just means it, what I found was true for that particular time only. Uh, here's a quote about that process. By the time we fully are able to identify a significant social trend, forces are already in operation to change it. Because human behavior is so variable, there are no universal sociological laws. Hmm. No, you, well, except that people don't often think for themselves. That's Maynard threw that in. Four, because sociologists are part of the social world they study, objectivity being 100% value free in social research is especially difficult. Um, actually, I, this, this actually took place uh, back in the 1950s, uh, the sugar industry. I think it was uh, Harvard was the first uh, graduate school nutrition. Cornell was pretty close to that too. So uh, they hired one of the preeminent uh, nutritionists in the, in the United States to head up their new program. And a couple of the professors in the program were approached by the sugar industry with a lucrative study, meaning the Harvard would get a lot of money and so would the professors by, by demonstrating how healthy uh, eating sugar actually is. Now, Today, we consider sugar to be one of the worst things you can possibly put into your body, along with vegetable oils, by the way, uh, corn syrup, any form of sugar that it just rips your body apart, okay? But they were being given, now at that time, you know, not much was done studying sugar. And so who's sponsoring the study? The sugar industry, as in find something good about sugar. Now, I'm not saying these people lied, but they're going to look at, they're going to cherry pick the data. Cherry picking the data means you look at the available data and you pick out only that data that supports the point of view you want to make. And so you specifically exclude data that doesn't. You see this all the time between conservatives and liberals. Uh, each side will haul out very specific facts, data that only support their point of view, selectively leaving out the facts that don't support their point of view. That's why I indicated to you when you write these personal opinion statements, you need to look at both articles. You can't just, you can't just give me a one-sided opinion that doesn't even consider what the other side said because then you too are cherry picking. Anyway, um, so of course they found that sugar was incredibly helpful for you and recommended that, I don't know how many teaspoons a day, you know, would give you energy and was really healthy. You know, now today we know that'd be some of the worst health advice you could possibly give anyone. So the point being, it's not objective research in this case, it was research that was tuned into wherever the money was coming from. Okay. You also need to know on page 42, the four methods of sociological research. Four methods, sounds like an old Motown band. Anyway, a research method is a systematic plan for doing research. So on page 
53, uh, the four methods and their advantages and limitations are summarized. Now, I always direct you to these charts because they give you a quick overview of things. So if you can read that chart and you can clearly understand the limitations uh, and advantages of each of these four methods, then you got it after reading through it the first time. If you don't, then go back and read it again, because if you could understand the chart completely and rattle it off in your mind, you got it. But again, first read the section, look at the chart. If you still don't get the chart and you can't rattle off those differences in your logic and your thinking, then go back and read it again. So here's the point. It's not so much about memorizing stuff in this course. It's about thinking it through enough to understand it. So that's why I say whenever I start a presentation, put on your thinking caps. Think with me. Don't just sit there. Think along with me. That's And that way you'll understand the material, not just memorize it. Okay, so the four methods. First is testing a hypothesis, the experiment. An experiment is a research method for investigating cause and effect under highly controlled conditions. Experiments are created to test a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a statement of possible relationship between two or more variables. So the hypothesis is if this were to happen, then that would be the result. Okay, so these are uh, experiments are uh, very typical of psychology, uh, not exclusively or in social psychology, like the, say, the famous uh, Stanford experiment. Uh, as an example of social psychology. Uh, okay, um, and, and here's a time-tested one. Um, students uh, in Memorial, you know, back to when uh, students in uh, Neanderthal students were attending college at Neanderthal U. Um, <laughs> they have big foreheads. Anyway, um, uh, a famous experiment done was you tell your friends that we're going to have a big beer party today. Now, this is assuming that you're 21 or you have a fake ID. Anyway, so we're going to have a big beer party tonight. And you're going to have the beer in unmarked containers, pitchers, whatever. And you're telling everybody at the gathering that this is going to be really heavy duty, high alcohol content beer, when in fact, you're going to serve non alcoholic beer. Now, the whole time people are drinking, you're going to keep throwing out that idea that, oh, man, I can't believe we're drinking this high-powered beer, you know, blah, 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 blah. And you'll actually watch people start showing signs of intoxication, even though that's literally impossible because they're drinking virtually no alcohol content beer. A famous experiment that you can perhaps replicate because I don't think anything changes that one over time. Well, the limitations of experiments are because they're typically conducted in an artificial lab setting, uh, is that this artificial quality uh, may not totally replicate the actual uh, social environment in which life takes place. Um, so the environment has to be carefully controlled or otherwise the results may be biased. A uh, second approach is asking questions, survey research. A research method in which subjects respond to a series of statements or questions uh, on a questionnaire, which could be self-administered, uh, typically it is, or in an interview. Uh, so for example, before the election, um, our phones were all going off constantly uh, with people who were conducting polls. How are you going to vote? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Uh, asking, interviewing us over the phone. Um, in fact, one survey asked in general, do you feel that surveys usually serve a good purpose or do you feel that they are usually a waste of time and money? Good purpose, 71%, waste, 14%, it depends, the wishy-washy crowd, 8%, and 7% didn't know or didn't respond. Now, whenever I give you these surveys, I know it's probably they didn't respond, but I prefer to think they didn't know, like, Duh. It, you know, there's more comedy in that. Uh, surveys are uh, typical of, for example, uh, not exclusively, but social work does a lot of surveying. Uh, political science does a lot of surveying.
Okay, uh, the problem we've seen with surveys and polls recently is they haven't been super accurate. Uh, in the last election, uh, the polls did predict a Biden victory, uh, but the, um, the razor thin margin by which Biden won, yes, he actually won the election, folks. Uh, one in uh, certain states was, was uh, a slimmer margin than many of the polls predicted. Anyway, the limitations of surveys are the questions must be carefully prepared to avoid bias. Okay, so let's suppose I'm doing a study of uh, uh, people's opinions of recent presidents. And so my lead off question is, uh, how about Trump, worst president ever? Do you agree, disagree? What? Well, that's such a biased way of asking the question, you know? You'd have to ask it in a different way. How would you rate Trump's performance? So. Uh, uh, on a scale of one to 10, one being the highest, 10 being the lowest, that kind of a thing. Uh, or, or the Likert scale where you have five choices. Yeah. So um, also the questionnaires may yield a low return rate. Okay, so when the social work students have to conduct surveys for the research course, they will often tap into my goodwill in enabling them to come to the sociology course that I teach in the spring, which typically has 50 to 60 students enrolled. They hand out the surveys. Nobody has to complete them. It's optional, but they hand out the survey at the beginning of class, takes about seven, eight minutes to complete it. And at the end of the class, the students all give them to me and I give them back to the student. Now the student could have just gotten 50 surveys right off the bat like that, got a, got a quick return. Had the student, for example, put, put them all instead in student mailboxes, who knows how many they would have gotten back. Maybe only would have gotten back three returns. And what are you going to conclude based on just three out of 100 surveys? What can you conclude? You know, it's only three people. Um, also, uh, interviews are expensive and time consuming. So let's go a different way. Uh, for those people who are hired, uh, pollsters who are hired by the Democrats and the Republicans to do polls, find out how things are going. That's not cheap. That's expensive. You've got to pay for all these people, you know, manning the phones, calling people. It's very time consuming. Or for example, let's suppose you are doing a survey and you decided, you know what, instead of handing them out, I'm going to hang out at the uh, Canova Commons and as students are eating, uh, I'll sit down with each student and interview the student and ask the student to complete the survey and I'll ask the questions. That's very time consuming. And when you ask the questions, you have to be careful. There's no bias in your voice as you ask the question. Uh, next form of research is in the field participant observation, a research method in which investigators systematically observe people while joining them in their routine activities. Well, anthropologists do this all the time. So for example, uh, let's suppose somebody is going to study the Trobrian Island. This has often been studied, indigenous people. And so um, this person will carefully plan ahead, uh, go down with their permission, visit and live with the Trobrian Islanders for who knows, three to six months and observe them and then write about what they observe. Uh, the limitations are it's time consuming as I just described and replication of research is difficult. So for example, let's suppose this person does the study on the Trobrian Islanders, comes back, writes it up, publishes it, which will appear maybe two years after the study was, was actually done. And everybody reads about it and says, well, that's really interesting. So I'd like to study them too. Okay, so you plan to do that, which will take another year or two. You actually get down there. Well, by the time you've gotten there and, and conducted your study, time has gone by and the Trobrian Islanders may well have changed. And so what the first person observed, you may not see anymore. And second of all, what the, the first person, no matter what you do, you're still seeing it through your subjective lens as did the first participant observer. And so you may not see the same things through your subjective lens as the first person saw through his or her subjective lens. Also, the researcher must balance roles of participant and observer. So you get down and you're living with the Trobrian Islanders. And at what point do you feel comfortable enough that you feel like you're one of the tribe, but you can't be totally one of the tribe or you'd lose your objectivity in studying the tribe? 
On the other hand, how do you know at what point they're acting naturally because you've never seen them before you've been there. So how do you know they're totally accepting you and acting naturally? And the fourth method uh, is of social research is using available data, uh, existing sources, analyzing existing sources, data already gathered by others. So let's suppose I'm doing a study on, let's say, homelessness in the Lehigh Valley. And uh, first of all, I need to know how many homeless people there are. Okay, so if it was two years ago, I'd have to rely on census data that was submitted years before that, which may or may not be accurate. Now, and why I say it may or may not be accurate is because how, how do you know you've counted all the homeless people because they don't have addresses. Uh, and so um, that's why many uh, advocates of the homeless here in the United States argue that the census dramatically underestimates by as much as 50% the true number of homeless people in the United States. Um, so the alternative is I could go out and count them. I'll go out and figure out where all the homeless, well, how long is that going to take me? And do I have any more now? Do I know any more accurately than did the census takers? Am I counting all the homeless? Because I need that data in order to do my study. So instead, I'll just take advantage of what data is already out there and I have no control over any possible biases in the data. And the data I'm using, because I don't want to have to construct my own for any study, may or may not exactly fit the study I'm doing. Uh, but I'll try to make it fit because I don't want to have to go to the trouble or am I able to gather the initial data that I need, the demographic data. So research methods are neither good nor bad per se, but only as they're applied appropriately or inappropriately at a particular use. So it's sort of like, uh, think of these different uh, methods of sociological research as like a toolbox you have and like a carpenter. And so, okay, what's the task? The task is we need to put a screw in the wall. Well, you could use a hammer and hammer it in, but I think we all know that's a real bad idea. So instead you use a screwdriver. So you use the tool out of your sociological research toolbox that's appropriate for what it is you want to research. Okay. What else do we got here? I'll wrap it up with a couple of quotes. First, Albert Einstein. Ever hear him? Real smart dude. Uh, appeared in the early 1900s with his famous, 1905 was some of his most famous research that came out that actually changed our understanding of the universe. Anyway, he said, the most incomprehensible fact about the world is that it is comprehensible. Artemis Ward said, it's not the things we don't know that get us in trouble. It's the things we know that just ain't so. That's all for chapter two. See you real soon with chapter three.